Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Brian Sanders. You're listening to Peak Human, the podcast where you start back at episode one or work your way backwards, whatever you'd prefer. Tons of great doctors, scientists, and regenerative egg experts. We're on a mission together to change the world. We want to change how people view food and what to eat, diet, lifestyle, go back to how our ancestors did it. That's what we do around here. Also, the Food Lies docuseries. We're working on it hard daily. Things are moving well. We're going to be pitching it around this summer to the major platforms. Also, nosetail.org. We got the regenerative meat. That's what I do as well. And the Sapien Center, if you're in Austin. Got a lot going on all around natural living, clean eating, exercise, sleep, movement, all the good stuff. Today, I talked to Dr. Chris Kenobi, my pal. He's been on the show before. He's got some great presentations on YouTube you can check out. He's got a book called The Ancestral Diet Revolution, How Vegetable Oils and Processed Foods Destroy Our Health and How to Recover. He's great. He's all about Weston Price. He's all about getting rid of the processed foods, how the seed oils are killing us, making us fat and sick, and has so much good information, so much science on why that's happening, why it's more than calories, why seed oils are specifically bad for human health. We break it all down in this episode. I love this episode. So much good info. This is a great one to share with family and friends. Here's a little bit more about Dr. Chris Kenobi. Chris Kenobi, MD, is a physician, researcher, ophthalmologist, public health advocate, and associate clinical professor emeritus, formerly of the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. Dr. Kenobi is known primarily for his research, publications, and presentations connecting westernized diets and highly polyunsaturated vegetable oils to numerous chronic diseases, including coronary heart disease, hypertension, stroke, cancers, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, autoimmune diseases, and age-related macular degeneration, AMD. Dr. Kenobi's research has focused greatly on the vegetable oil hypothesis as a primary driver of overweight and chronic disease. In 2016, Kenobi formally introduced a hypothesis that processed foods and vegetable oils are the primary drivers of AMD, which is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness in people over the age of 50 worldwide. He's doing great work. We had a fun podcast, such an interesting talk. Listen to the end of this one. It's a good one all the way through. Check out nosetail.org, and we'll see you next week. How's it going, Dr. Chris Kenobi? Juan, once again. <laughs> I'm great, Brian. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Yeah, we did a show a while ago, and we spent some time in person over the years at different conferences, and yeah, it's great to be on again because you have a new book. What's right. the title of the book? Tell me more. The title of the book is The Ancestral Diet Revolution, and this is really a book that... Um, I, I say really it's been in the in the making for about 12 years since I really kind of went started going down this path myself of trying to understand nutrition, which was 2011. And uh, so, uh, but I had the impetus to write this book beginning really about three years ago, Brian. It was probably early 2020. Um, and uh, again, just because mostly this book focuses on vegetable oil, highly polyunsaturated vegetable oil, or maybe what we'd call seed oils, uh, seed oil dangers. And, um, and so, um, yeah, I just felt like this, this obviously hasn't been very well covered. It's certainly not in textbooks or, or books. Um, and so anyway, that was the impetus. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got it here. I didn't finish it. We we're just talking about how we wish we could finish all the books we wanted to finish. Uh, I have a whole bookshelf and a pile that I need to read, but thankfully I got through some of this. It's so good. It's so good. It's actually put out by the, the Cure AMD Foundation and the Ancestral Health Foundation. So two foundations that you're a part of or started. And so the proceeds go to the foundations, not to you. Right, right. I don't accept any compensation for the work I do in this field, Brian. Well, it's great. I just wanted to throw that out in the beginning. We're not just here trying to hawk your book. We're no. here to talk about health and seed oils and all this stuff. No, I decided I left practice, um, ophthalmology practice back in 2015 to pursue this because 
I felt, you know, that at the time I was, I was uh, rather convinced that um, seed oil or, you know, processed foods and seed oils were the primary drivers of age-related macular degeneration, AMD. And um, 2016, I went public with that and 2017 started Cure AMD Foundation. And um, at that point, really, Brian, I just had to, I decided, you know, am I, am I going to try to make a business out of this? Or am I just going to do, uh, you know, am, am I just going to try to bring this message to the world? And I just, I decided for the latter that, you know, I'm, I'm in a position where um, uh, I, I'm fortunate enough to be able to do this. And I think it's just important enough that I try to get this message out there. That's great. That's great. There's more people need to just go down that path and, and make it their life's work kind of as you've done and you've gotten out of the game, saved up some money and now you're good to go. So talk about AMD really quick because people can go back and listen to my episode with you, but okay. just because you have the ophthalmology background, explain how that connection with your diet. Sure. And so this is really, um, this is, this is the reason that I left practice for people, for people that don't know age related macular degeneration or AMD is the, is the leading cause of irreversible vision loss and blindness in people over the age of 50 worldwide. Um, the disease as of 2020 affects right around 200 million people with around as of 2006 already there was 14 million people uh, that are bilaterally severely vision impaired and or blind bilaterally that's you know that's that's a lot of people that are blind from this disease and uh, but but before I'd even left practice practice I had determined by investigating the history in depth uh, which took many months that macular degeneration was an extremely rare disorder in the 19th century when it was first um, potentially diagnosable, which began in 19 or in 1851, when the um, handheld ophthalmoscope was was, was uh, invented and released. Um, and uh, but between 1851 and about 1930, there were no more than about 50 cases of AMD in all the world's literature. Um, it wasn't even described in the United States, for example. Um, and, um, but by, you know, again, by, the, the, so it just kind of went through the roof, you know, beginning probably in the 1950s, 60s uh, in the United States, the United Kingdom, and then Europe. And, and now it's just kind of spread all around the world. And that's why we have two around, you know, it's reported as 196 million people affected in 2020. That's why I said about 200 million mm -hmm. and 288 million expected to be affected by 2040. But what I did was um, with a small team, we, we looked at the consumption of sugar and vegetable oils as markers of processed food. And we tracked those in 25 nations versus the prevalence of macular degeneration in every single nation, Brian, we showed that this increase in macular degeneration, if there was one, was, you know, was correlated strongly to, you know, to vegetable oils primarily and some, you know, less to lesser degrees with sugar. Um, but, you know, like in the one of the Pacific Islands in Kiribati, um, the sugar consumption was moderately high but they had virtually no seed oil consumption at that time, or really low anyway. And um, they had almost no macular degeneration. So, so anyway, it's a, it's a very, very complex disease. Um, and and I, I hate putting it that way, but it is macular degeneration is exceedingly complex. If you think, you know, heart disease is complex, it's way, it's far more complex than that, in my view. And uh, so and I don't know if we need to get into the, you know, the molecular detail, but, but in essence, it is processed foods and vegetable oils that I am absolutely convinced are driving AMD. And, we, and, and AMD is a disease that, like almost all of the chronic diseases, is completely, utterly preventable. And you can also generally just stop it in its tracks. By, by giving up processed foods and getting off of seed oils. And we've seen this, so, so my, that book that I 
published on macular degeneration back in 2016, reached a lot of people. And a lot of those people started connecting with me in 2016. So, you know, this is what, six, seven years, almost seven years ago. And those people, virtually all of them have stabilized their macular degeneration, all but maybe one or two. And I, don't, I think those, those couple are, you know, are not being that caught careful about their diet. So I would say the anecdotal evidence is that you could put this, you can put this, this uh, disease uh, on hold as far as progression is concerned. I'm not saying you can always reverse it, but you can stop the progression of the disease. And that's a huge deal because, you know, people usually, they're not, they're not blind by the time they're diagnosed. They may have some vision loss, but um, if you can stop that progression, that's enormous. Wow. Yeah. I would say go back and listen to our first episode. You get more into those details. But hey, everyone, just want to jump in here and give a quick shout out to my company, Notes of Tail. We do all the great things with the great ranchers and the great producers of boutique, high-end, high-quality natural products. Notesatail.org. We have all the meat, regeneratively grown you can grab it there, get it sent to your door. We pay half your shipping. We also have the body care products made from beef tallow. This is the good stuff. People absolutely love it. They can't get enough of it. The skin food, people using it as beard cream. We have hair food now. You can style your hair. We have leave-in conditioning hair food. We've got the soap, all the good body care products, and of course, the biltong on the go. You got to get your meat in. We have liverboards as well, which has liver in it. Great way to get liver in your diet in a delicious way. So, nosetail.org, check it out. We have free shipping options. Thanks for supporting us. For now, we can move on to all the other diseases caused by the processed foods and the seed oils because that's more applicable to the audience probably. And right. it's so connected, right? This is the stuff, I mean, we, we've all in this space kind of come to this same conclusion, you know, somewhat independently, somewhat reading you know, Weston Price, for example, that you're a big fan of his work and really is all converging around the processed foods and the seed oils being at the root of the problem of all of this modern disease. And, and then I want to throw out a plug again for the book. Amazing graphs, so many charts and graphs, incredible, so much work that you've done to put them all together. It's worth it to buy the book alone, just to, you don't even have to read it. You can just leaf through and look at these graphs and you'll learn so much and it's amazing. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I, you know, people will get that by the end of the book if they, if they were to sit and read it, or even as you said, if you just go through it and look at all the graphs, I created around 80, I think around 80 graphs or modified up to 80 graphs. Some, some of those are, some of those are modified from other researchers, but the huge bulk of those came from me and, you know, colleagues that helped me um, to produce those. And then I just, you know, modified them to, to try to make them um, jump out at us in terms of what the effect is. But, um, but yeah, I, I, people will realize that I'm a data junkie by the end of this book, because I believe, you know, you can't, uh, you, you know, you, it's hard to convince anyone about a hypothesis unless you have data and graphs. I learned that honestly from, I think from Stefan Guillenet more than anybody that, you know, his, the, the evidence he was showing uh, back before 2015, you know, really convinced me that that's what I needed to do as well. And so I just kind of, you know, that's been a huge part of, uh, of what I've done over the last eight years is, is data. Yeah. Well, it shows you need it. Yeah, show me the data. And, and yes, of course, people should request that to back yeah. it up. And luckily, all this stuff has been shown in the data. People say, oh, Weston Price, that was 100 years ago. He just went around and like made some observations. And I'm saying, no, he actually was a good scientist. He did a lot of studies and collected a lot of data. And all of that basically has been proven out by science. It's not that we're just relying on some guy from 100 years ago. There's so many studies, so much data that's come in to support all of his findings. That's the beauty of it. So we should dig into some of this stuff. And maybe what's the highest level we can get? Like why say seed oil specifically over other processed foods? Because all the processed foods are bad. Some people blame it on carbs, 
right? There's, there's a big movement of keto and low carb over the years, which is great. And you can get a lot of benefits from cutting out carbs, but that doesn't mean that carbs are bad, right? This is something I've been talking about for years now that we, we can't just blame carbs. I mean, processed foods, yes, you know, refined sugars probably, but I guess the highest level that we could intro this is from some of your graphs, right? Tons of graphs showing that, hey, we've cut down sugar a bit. You know, things have gone down, yet obesity and chronic disease and everything else has gotten worse while we're while we've been cutting out carbs and sugar. Right. Yeah. And and that's what I've tried to to, to figure out, Brian, is um you know, really, I, I mean, I want to know for myself, I want to know for my family, and I want to, and then I want to know for the world. And um, so I have to, it's, it's hard to tease apart. Sorry about that noise there. It's hard to tease apart, um, you know, what are the major drivers until you start looking at data versus the prevalence of whatever you want to look at, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and, you, and then you, you, you know, once you plot that data, then you can start visualizing what is it that's driving the, the all of this disease. And you can see that, you know, for example, um, that sugar um, has a very poor correlation with obesity and diabetes in the United States. And, well, in fact, most countries. But and since, you know, and if you go through the book, you'll see that um, in the United States, sugar has been going down since 1999. Carbohydrates have been going down since 1997. Total calories have been going down since 2002. And yet this is the time when obesity and diabetes and metabolic syndrome have had their greatest increases. And it's similar, it's similar data in four other countries. So in Australia, you see that sugar and carbohydrates have been going down since 1961 while obesity and diabetes um, go up. And it's similar in the United Kingdom. You've got sugar going down since 1961. And yet, again, you have all of this, you know, obesity and obesity in the United Kingdom has risen fourfold in that time frame. I think from 7% in 1980 to 28% more recently, I think 2010 or so. Um, similar situation in Israel and then Japan, we can go into depth in Japan later, but it's a similar situation there. You have, uh, as the United States, you've got calories, carbohydrates, and sugars all recently going down while, while obesity, diabetes, cancer, um, and, uh, uh, what else, um, I'm trying to remember, um, it, it, uh, uh, cancer, diabetes, uh, macular degeneration, all going through the roof, mm -hmm. right? You know, so, so it, it, you, it's going to be really hard for people to make an argument that it's sugar when you see that they're, go you know, these are going down in, in many countries and even globally since the 19, uh, since about 1970, sugar has only changed about 5% globally. And carbohydrates have gone slightly down one and a half percent since around 1970. And yet obesity in men, I think uh, in men about approximately tripled in that time frame and obesity in women approximately doubled, uh, more than doubled in women during that time frame. And diabetes has, has gone way up um, globally. So again, as you look at, you start looking at the big picture and, you know, whether you look in, a, in just, a, you know, a few single countries or you look at the whole world, you see that the data doesn't support um, any suggestion at all that this is just about sugar or carbohydrates. Um, and in fact, you know, many other researchers have noted this and this has been this is, uh, you know, I didn't come up with that evidence for the most part. Like, for example, in, I mean, we did in the United States, but United Kingdom and Australia, um, that evidence was already published. And, you know, it's well known that, you know, sugar and carbohydrates have been going down while obesity and diabetes go through the roof. So you have to say, well, what is the answer? And, uh, um, you know, so, so again, that's, that's what I've tried to do. Yeah. 
and no one's saying that sugar and refined carbs are good. It's not, it's not healthy. It's not gonna, you know, it's not health promoting, but it may be just not be the, the thing that's ruining everyone's health completely. Uh, and also like the correlation, everyone knows that correlation doesn't equal causation, right? But what's more interesting is there's a reverse correlation. It can do a lot more to show that maybe this is not the cause, right? Like that makes sense to people. So just because the seed oils have risen with the type two diabetes and all this other stuff doesn't necessarily mean that it's a cause. But you, I mean, you have to find more info, which you've done to show that that is why. But if you're seeing all these things go down, like you said, calories even going down, yet the problems are going up. That's just a good indication. It, do, it does a lot for your argument that saying that this cannot be the problem. Yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, people will say that, well, this is, you know, you can't draw a causative inference from population studies. And, um, and, and yet, you know, all, all of us who believe in Weston Price's research, that's what we've done, right? We've, it, those are all observational studies. Um, and I, I think observational studies are really, really powerful and by far the best evidence because as you know, Brian, we, you know, you can't control diets in people except for very short periods of time. Like the longest I've seen any dietary, complete dietary control in people, I think was six months. Um, you know, cause you have to put them, you have to put people into a metabolic ward. They're essentially prisoners of the ward of the of a hospital typically they cannot leave everything that they eat has to be tracked you it has to be prepared in a metabolic kitchen tracked it's extraordinarily expensive and um again you know you, you can't let anybody leave at all because they could go to mcdonald's and have a hamburger and french fries and a coke and now your study is ruined um so so it you know there's very precious few studies where where um, diets have been controlled in people, um, and, uh, uh, and, and those are in general, not very good. Whereas if you look at the population data, you know, we've got data going clear back to the early 19th century on sugar and on vegetable oils when they first began, which is, you know, consumption began right after the American civil war. And we've got data that tracks all this. So you know basically what the population is doing um, as a whole, and you can track them, like in this case, for a century and a half um, in the United States. Um, there's no other country where we have data uh, that, that is, has you know, been tracked that carefully as the United States. The, we did have data in the United Kingdom on vegetable oil going back to, the, to 1942, I believe, but other than that, almost all the other data is begins with um, the um, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, which has tra you know tracked data on on food consumption since nineteen from nineteen sixty one through about two thousand ten, and then there's some other organizations that have tracked you know food consumption data since two thousand ten. Um, so we do have some you know some of that evidence, but. But if you look at all that, and then you have you have a couple of whole pictures, so you could then you can look at it versus obesity in the entire nation, or diabetes in the entire nation, or whatever you want to, you know, whatever disease you want to look at. If there's if there's evidence for that, if there's mm -hmm. you know prevalent studies for those conditions, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm just thinking about the rise since the 1800s. So there was a huge rise in re refined sugar. We didn't have access; it was very expensive. So that's what I'm saying that. There are other factors, but we're talking about in the last couple decades, we can start to tease those things out because they've gone down. So like, I think my view of it is, well, we, it, our diets are very different from back in the day. And we're eating way more of these refined grains, refined sugars, all kinds of other stuff, food additives. Oh, there's so many things that have gone to the food and there, there's so many problems with that. But then it's interesting to just know, but what specifically is the, the, the biggest problem or what you look at the difference of, okay, well, what is the, yeah, what gave us the biggest uptick? Like what, what moves the needle the most, right? That's what matters. 
And right. I'm also looking why pe- why do people eat too much? It's like no one wants to just overeat and gain weight. And so I think a lot of the empty calories from sugar, refined grains, seed oils, they are just driving people to eat too much, right? Because they're not getting enough nutrients, they're not getting enough protein. They're stuffed into all the foods. There's a lot of Dr. Ted Naiman stuff. You know, he really talks about this a lot and he's great. But then beyond that, beyond that, it sounds like there's something extra wrong with seed oils. And I guess that's what the audience probably wants to hear is like, what is that extra problem? Right. Well, um, so in general, if we just talk about what's wrong with, with seed oils, um, it, you know, that's a, that's a very, very, um, you know, easy question and a very, very complex answer. But the main thing I tell people and, and I go into in the book is that seed oils are pro oxidative, pro inflammatory, toxic, and nutrient deficient. And if you put those four, I call them pillars of hazard together, and you have the, you know, you've got the recipe for absolute metabolic disaster, because these are chronic metabolic biological poisons is what seed oils are. And the reason that they are, Brian, is because this, the seed oils, which let me just name them, by the way. So people, you know, if people are hearing this for the first time, that's basically the ones that are on the worst of the worst list would be soybean, corn, canola, cottonseed, rapeseed, grapeseed, sunflower, safflower, rice bran, and then even sesame and peanut oils. Although I'd say those are, you know, not as hazardous as the others I just listed. So those are the worst of the worst. And the reason that they are is that they're very high in omega-6 fat. And omega-6 fat should be consumed in very, very small quantities. We can get into that too. But what happens is, is if you consume these, they accumulate in your body. They accumulate in your tissues. They accumulate in your cellular membranes, in your mitochondrial membranes, and in your body fat, in your adipose. And that sets up this environment that is, as I said, pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory, toxic, and nutrient deficient. Well, what do I mean by that? So pro-oxidative means that it's like we're literally rusting inside. And this is the case because the um, omega-6 fats are polyunsaturated fats. That means they have multiple double bonds. And those double bonded fats are highly subject to oxidative attack, which means that, you know, your body produces, we produce enormous amounts of free radicals like uh, hydroxyl radical, superoxide, um, uh, um, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and these attack the double bonds and create um, what's then called a, high, um, a uh, lipid hydroperoxide. And those lipid hydroperoxides, then they degenerate into advanced lipid oxidation end products, ALs, and these are things like carb, uh, like uh, 4-H&E, 4-hydroxinonanol, malondialdehyde, or MDA, carboxyethylpyrrole, acrolein, um, 9 and 13, hode. And then there's just literally hundreds of others, Brian. They have these advanced lipid oxidation end products. So I tell people this is like, this is the equivalent of smoking. So when you consume seed oils, you, you know, you, the, these are going to be broken down. These are going to be, you know, in, into more advanced uh, metabolic end products similar to smoking tobacco, which produces more than 6,000 chemicals. Well, vegetable oils will break down into hundreds of chemicals that are all collectively very, very dangerous. They're cytotoxic, genotoxic, mutagenic, carcinogenic, atherogenic, thrombogenic, obesogenic, and diabetogenic, right? So, so, so that's the, you know, that's part of the, um, that's kind of oxidation and toxicity all in one. You have the inflammatory component. So, you know, when you consume seed oils, the, the, omega, the primary omega-6 fat is linoleic acid. And that linoleic acid then gives rise to arachidonic acid, which the downstream products of that are metabolites that are, um, that are you know, ultimately, you know, prostaglandin, you've got inflammatory prostaglandins, eicosanoids, leukotrienes, and thromboxanes, which collectively cause vasoconstriction, inflammation, um, and clotting. So, you know, so, so you've got all those, you've got, so there, there we've covered a little bit about oxidation, inflammation, 
toxicity and then you have the nutrient deficiency. So when you, so the, the healthy animal fats like lard, butter, and beef tallow, those come with fat soluble vitamins, A, D, and K2, which are cr very critical to health. I mean, this is what Weston Price's research was primarily about was the fact that when people consumed these, you know, processed foods, they were cutting out the fat soluble vitamins. And so those vitamins were being displaced. And that's exactly what happens when you consume vegetable oils instead of like butter or eggs or milk, you know, whole milk or whatever that gives you the fat soluble vitamins. So now you've got, so there's the nutrient deficiency part, which, you know, contributes greatly to degenerative disease. And that can be anything from, you know, arthritis to cancers to, you know, um, clotting disorders and so forth. So, so th there you go. That's basically it, Brian, in a nutshell, that's kind of the pathophysiology, uh, you know, without, you know, that's probably too much depth <laughs> already, you know, to be, you know, for people just to be listening to, but anyway, that's kind of, that's kind of the mechanisms by which vegetable oils drive so much chronic disease. They're poisons, they're metabolic poisons is what they are. Well, and it makes sense because these are very new things we haven't eaten for all of history. They're made basically from, yeah, leftover products of like cottonseed and, you know, Procter Gamble and some other companies like this, Crisco, they f decided they could make a lot of money off them. And right. usually things go wrong when you do something that we haven't done for all of history and you put something in your body that your body's not ready for and in the quantities that we're not ready for, ready as in, accustomed to or genetically designed to eat. And that that's kind of the main thesis of I've had many people talk about the, the, why the seed oils are the problem and specifically the high linoleic acid, because we, this is the biggest change that we've seen in our, in our diet. We've seen protein, carbs, fats for all of history, and we've had different ratios of proteins, fats, and carbs, different populations. Some people closer to the equator, they eat more carbs, and it's all fine and they're healthy and they're great. And you can talk about the Tokelauans and all, you know, the interesting case studies. They're all fine. You go up north, they're eating more protein and fat and they're great and fine and healthy. And maybe they're even doing better. They're actually taller. If you look at the data that, you know, they're more robust, the more protein, animal protein and fats they eat. Different story, but still fine. They don't have all the chronic disease. The biggest right. change is this influx of linoleic acid through these unnatural seed oils. And it just makes so much sense why these are so damaging beyond the calories. I just want to stress that one more time because all the things you listed weren't about over consuming calories, right? There are problems yeah. with over consuming energy calories. I always like to differentiate nutrient calories, which includes proteins and energy calories, which is, you know, fats and carbs. We are consuming too many energy calories, huge difference, right? Than protein calories or, or nutrients. So, but there still is a big difference between someone who's just over consuming calories in general and all the problems you just listed from the seed oil specifically. So I think that's a, that's a major sticking point, right? Because there's guys like Lane Norton who I had on my show and I, we didn't get into all these details enough. Actually, maybe we have to do another little debate between you and him or something where he's just so focused on the calorie part, but at least he does differentiate between protein calories and energy calories, right? He gets it. He, he gets the satiety stuff and why people overeat and why you want to eat whole foods and why you want to eat protein and, and stuff like that. So he gets it. But a lot of people in the mainstream don't get the non-caloric problems with seed oils. So that's again, what you listed out and we should keep going into throughout this discussion is beyond just the calories. Why are they bad? You're right, Brian. That's, you know, that, that's well put. Um, and, you know, if you look at virtually any population in the world, I mean, and, and as, you, as you know, this is what I've done is I, I focus greatly on different populations because you can look at those that just as you as you already alluded to those that consume really high carbohydrate diets like the japanese the okinawans the papua new guineans of tukacenta extremely high carbohydrate they're all more than 84 percent carbohydrate diets and yet they're very very healthy and then you could look at the populations that consume really high fat diets like the maasai of kenya and tanzania their diet is about 66 percent animal fat all coming from 
uh, mostly milk is where their fat is coming from. Um, and yet they're exquisitely healthy and lean. Um, and it was, you know, very similar situation for the Inuit that what people would have, uh, uh, in many years, many years ago called the Eskimos, but the Inuit consumed a very high fat, very, you know, very carnivorous type of diet had almost no fruit or vegetables at all in their diet for 11 months of the year. And yet then they are not as lean, um, but traditionally, but there's, but they're certainly healthy and Weston price, uh, uh, reviewed them in great detail. Um, but when you begin to consume processed foods, no matter how you do it, you just, as you already alluded to, um, you, you almost always are going to overconsume calories as well. And it's just impossible, um, not to, for so many reasons. And some of those you've already talked about, Brian, the fact that that these foods are nutrient deficient. And in the United States, around 63% of the diet is highly processed, meaning ultra processed. That's refined flours, refined sugars, vegetable oils, and trans fats. As of 2009, um, it's about 50% uh, ultra processed in the United Kingdom, for example. And, um, you know, so what, ha you know, so there's many reasons for this, but a couple or that, you know, the, the nutrient deficiency, I think drives you to try to consume more food because you're trying, your body is trying to get those vitamins and minerals, um, for one thing. Um, but the vegetable oils, um, you know, they, they also induce, um, uh, lack of satiety essentially. So they're, they, they have mechanisms, but are biological mechanisms through anandamide and two and two AG breakdown products of omega-6 linoleic acid that, um, that, that, that induce a lack of satiety and cause us to eat more, just the, uh, very much the equivalent of smoking marijuana. Um, and uh, that, that's another reason that we tend to overeat. But there's also, then I've, you know, I've been discussing this since 2019 at the Ancestral Health Symposium that Vegetable oils also severely damage the mitochondrial function and the electron transport chain function such that, you know, I think it's, it's, it becomes much more difficult, if not in some cases, almost impossible to properly burn fats for fuel because you've broken down mitochondrial function. And, and so therefore now you have a storage situation where I think the body begins to the cell at the cellular level, you're just beginning to store these fats that you can't properly burn because of the damage to this at the, you know, at the cellular machinery level. And so, um, so now you're storing fat, you're more, you're more, um, uh, uh prone to, to, you know, to need to burn carbohydrates for fuel. So these people become carb dependent, essentially. This is why they can't shift back and forth from, you know, fat or, you know, or just burning their own fat or, um, or, you know, uh, so you, in other words, utilizing a low carbohydrate diet or utilizing a very high fat diet, they, you know, they, they can't sh shift back and forth because of damage to the mitochondria. Met yeah. They're not metabolically flexible. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And you'll, you know, they, these people, when, you know, when you talk about trying to get people, um, make people metabolically flexible and get them bur burning fat for fuel and you can't do it, they can't do it for quite a long time. Um, why is that? And it's because their, you know, metabolic machinery is broken at the mitochondrial level due to this high omega-6 fat and all of the, and all of the downstream effects of that. Yes, that's a super important point because some people, they can't lose weight right away. You know, they try to do, they try to go low carb or, and also like people talk about low carb is almost just a band aid solution. You need to fix your metabolism. Yes. Low, going low carb is a great way to start losing weight and start that process and start to eat less energy calories, but you need to really fix your metabolism before it's going to work well. So some people may not lose weight right away or they may plateau. And yeah, it's just more in this discussion of why carbs aren't necessarily the necessarily the enemy. It's kind of just more about the whole foods, the process versus processed foods and the, you know, natural animal fats compared to the seed oils and high LA fats. Right. 
Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. So I'm not. I'm. I'm not here to. I, th I think this makes the. You know the the people that are proponents of the sugar hypothesis of obesity and chronic disease. This. This. When I talk about all this, it makes them angry. Uh, some of them, <laughs> and uh, and and it's just data. You know, it's the data that they don't like. But it's. Um, but yeah, I'm not here to to suggest or promote consuming. Uh, you know, excess sugar or refined carbs. Obviously, I have, you know, understood this for 10 years now that, um, uh, you know, it's refined carbohydrates, sugars and vegetable oils that are the primary problem. I mean, this is this goes clear back to Weston Price's research, because this is I mean, this is exactly what he had discovered by 1939. And um, I, as you said, in the beginning, I'm an acolyte of, of Price. And um, everything I see, the you know, the world of nutrition, Brian, I see it through the lens of Weston Price, and it's never failed me. I just follow, I follow that all the time, and it's, it, it has, you know, like I said, it's never mm -hmm. failed me. Well, I'm right there with you. Yeah, I mean, I don't say I just rely on it completely. That's why I always say it's all backed up, though, right? It's all backed yeah. up by modern science. That's why it never fails. Well, absolutely. Yeah, he basically figured it out, and now tons of scientists and doctors have done all the work to prove it just the message isn't out there right like we know this stuff everyone i interview knows this stuff everyone listening probably knows this stuff it just hasn't reached the mainstream yet right right yeah well, well let's break let's break it so, down more let's so okay I'll, i i think it's super interesting to talk about the tokulawans the sukasente the okinawans all these people that eat uh, high carbs and are fine Right. Just to, so let's go into that a little deeper because you alluded to it, but, but let's so go. The, yeah. So you want to talk about the toke allowance? Oh, just all of those different populations. You can, whatever you can remember. I know you don't, you can't just what? like spit everything no. out off the top of your head. Hope you've done right. a great job so far, but yes, these di these groups that eat high carb yet are metabolically healthy because they're not eating seed oils. That's the thing. These They did not come into the diet. So there's few people in the world that did not start consuming seed oils. The, I, I love it too. You were saying it's a Western price, modern displacement foods. That's what he called them. The modern foods of displacement. They displace good nutrition, good fats. Right, right. Yeah, well, if we talk about, you know, the populations that are, that are you know, very high carb and healthy, um, Brian, I think then we... You know, it wouldn't be the Tokelauans. Their diet was about 24% oh, yeah, yeah. carbohydrate. Saturated but, fat. They had the high coconut oil. Yeah, they, yeah their diet was 50% saturated fat coming from coconut oil. Or coconut fats in general, not just, yeah, I, they didn't extract the oil necessarily. No, no, no. It just came from eating uh, coconut because um, the oil is in there. So they, 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 they consumed the, you know, everything they could from the, the whole coconut. Um, yeah, so their diet was super high saturated fat. In fact, probably the highest saturated fat diet in the world. It was about, so it was, their diet was around 56% fat, which is if a high fat diet, um, and that was 49% um, saturated fat for the men, 51% saturated fat for the women. So it, it works out to be 50% saturated fat. This was all reported by Ian Pryor and colleagues in 1969. So their diet was 24% carbohydrate and 20% protein. And the, the Tokelauans were, you know, historically, all of the Pacific Islanders were in, in phenomenally healthy. I mean, this is not a high carb group, but since we're on the subject of, mm -hmm. of the Tokelauans and, and this subject, we might as well just hit it real quick, but because it's so interesting. But the, um, so the Tokelauans in, 19, in 1969, when they were evaluated by, by Ian Pryor, um, they were found, uh, you know, they were found to have um, a body fat of 3.8% omega-6 linoleic acid, which is one of the lowest uh, recorded in the world. Um, there's only, there's, about, there's four more populations that are even lower than that. But, but in the Pacific Islands, in several Pacific Islands, diabetes, you know, obesity, first of all, was virtually unknown. The, the Pacific Islanders were known to have some of the best physiques in the world. Diabetes in multiple Pacific islands were known to be was known to be zero before 1945. In Tokelau in 1969, diabetes was 2.15 percent. 
Um, so again, it was probably zero in 1945. It was 2.15% 2 in 1969. They probably had trivial oils at that point. Um, and, um, and di and, but diabetes as of 2013 in Tokelau had risen to 37 and a half percent. It's a 17 fold increase in a period of 44 years between 1969 and 2013, 17 fold increase in their diabetes. And all of the, almost all the Pacific Island countries are, the, are now among the most obese in the world. Like the obesity in Tokelau as of 2014 was, um, uh, 67% mm -mm. and they're overweight 23%. So total obesity and overweight 90% mm. as of 2014. So think about this in 1945, their obesity was probably close to zero. It was way under 1% and they had no diabetes. And now they're the most obese and diabetic nation in the world. It, that's right, ninety percent overweight and obese, and thirty-seven and a half percent diabetes. Um, you know today, um, and yeah, they just and the, these were people that when they were discovered by the the these Pacific Islanders like Tokelauans, um, when they were discovered by uh, Captain Cook and other French explorers and so forth back you know several hundred years ago, some of them described the, them as having godlike physiques, and one said can't remember which one it was, said it was as if I was transported into the Garden of Eden. These people were so brilliantly healthy and beautiful and, and had such stunning physiques. Um, but, okay, so here's what's happened, Brian. Here's what happened to their, their, their diet. So in 1968, this is from Ian Pryor's research, they consumed 84 calories of sugar per day. That's 3% of their diet. 80% of their calories came from cereals which was probably nutrient deficient. Um, so that's 3%. They had virtually no oils, okay, but no oils recorded, okay? They might've had some somewhere, but in, in Pryor's, Ian Pryor's research, they didn't have any, right? This is when they you know, were phenomenally healthy and had the very low uh, omega-6 linoleic acid in their body fat, 3.8%. Okay, by 2014, they had 129 grams of sugar in their diet, that's 517 calories, 51 grams of white flour, that's 203 calories worth, 17 grams of instant noodles. Um, I'm looking at this, I've got this, I just happen to have this data here, and 50 grams of vegetable oils by 2014. 50 grams of vegetable oils, this, now this is what I could track from what's reported. Um, and that, so that's 450 calories worth. That's roughly, you know, you're getting 20, plus percent of your calories right there out of the vegetable oils. And then what I couldn't track was they consumed a fair amount of tinned fish, um, which is ridiculous, but that's what they were getting, you know, cause they're right there where they could get, they get, <laughs> they get yeah. all this fish out of the ocean. Right. But they're getting tinned fish that came in, in uh, you know, in these cans. And so I couldn't really track that, but so they're probably getting 50 to seven, you know, somewhere between 50 and 70 grams of, seed oils per day by 2014. This is so this is primarily what happened to them, but more than half of their diet became, you know, by 2014 was processed food. Was you know, ultra processed food. And um so again, they went I, I, I just just to repeat. They went from zero obesity in 1945, zero diabetes, um phenomenally healthy, had no coronary heart disease in 1982, none in men 40 to 69 years of age to by 2014, the most obese country in the world, the most di most diabetes in the world, um, disaster, right? And the main thing that happened, it's processed food, but both, bo you know, the, I, the main, main problem is the vegetable oils. The good recap. Yep. Tons of processed foods. There was a lot of more sugar in their diet, but the biggest factor, the seed oils, and what changed the most? Like, this is so fascinating to me. They still, people try to blame it on genetics. No, genetics don't change that fast. Not at all. That's impossible. Same genetics. They try to blame it on environment factors, right? No, they're living in pristine islands. I mean, I'm sure, yeah. yes, they have, you know, a few more cars. It's like, okay, this is not making a big difference that they got a right. few more automobiles and there's like a little, you know, it, you, the clean water, 
like that not yeah. much change they're, they're still working outdoors like we're using some of this in the film i found different footage and documentaries these guys are still working outdoors you know you can't just yeah. blame it oh yeah like they don't move as much anymore uh, not in the Tokel Islands, you know, I mean, maybe in the U.S., yeah, we're not moving as, as much because we have a more sedentary lifestyle, but that's not the biggest factor. These people are still working outdoors. They're in the sun. They have clean water. They're doing generally all the healthy things you're supposed to do. What's changed? Processed foods and mostly seed oils. That's the one thing that's changed. Right, right. Absolutely. And, you know, if, 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 you know, this is probably be the least scientific thing I'll say today, Brian, but, but if you observe, um, you know, the, some of the people that work the hardest, I mean, laborers, landscapers and so forth, that, I mean, that, I honestly can't do that work for three days. It, it, it'll kill me, you know? Um, but yet these are some of the, I, I hate to say it, but these are some of the most obese people, um, you know, because again, they're consuming a standard American diet, right? And it's certainly not that they're not getting tons of, these people get way more exercise than I do. It's uh, a good point. Know. And it's good that you set it out. Yes, this is anecdotal, observational, not scientific, but I make those same observations, right? I, I It fascinates me. I play volleyball, beach volleyball a lot. There are people that are playing four times a week and they're still got a giant beer belly. Yeah. Right. You and I know these people. They're they're working hard. They're exciting. I I've seen laborers. I've seen construction guys. I've seen tourists. I've seen walking guides. <laughs> There's this guy. He was the shape of a beach ball, and he was a walking tour guide every day. He just did tours, yeah. gave tours. You cannot say that it's be. Oh, he didn't take enough steps. <laughs> he didn't do enough. This guy moving all day. It's what you eat. I don't know how many times I need to make this point in this podcast think people are convinced it's what you eat matters most oh yeah I, it's it's i think it's at least 80 percent plus diet um and the other 20 percent exercise and i i i'm a you know i'm i'm really interested in fitness i always have been um and uh you know i go to the gym five or six days a week and i've watched people that you know that spend an hour an hour and a half on a treadmill or elliptical or those kinds of those kinds of things for years um, and, you know, never, never get, never look any healthier, um, you know, that are, they're far overweight, but yeah. Um, you want to talk about Japan because this well, is yeah. a great, because you were talking about high carbohydrate. High and, carb. Yeah. Sorry. I, I did get confused with the Toku allowance. I mixed up my, my teas, the Sukasente. <laughs> yeah. But yes, there are these other populations that eat high carb. Go for it. Yeah, no, I'm glad you brought up Tokel Allens because I love that subject, as you can tell. Um, I think it's so interesting. I, 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 I mean, I, you know, it, it, it's another of the populations that paints the picture of, of you know, what's gone wrong. So it's terrible that that's, this is what's happened to them. Let's talk about Japan because, so Japan, and I've studied, you know, the Japanese diet um, uh, qu quite at length. And I, and so... So the Japanese, by some accounts, have eaten fish and rice for thousands of years. That's been the mainstay of their diet, fish, rice, and small amounts of vegetables. And the Okinawans, which is just a subset of Japanese, it's the southernmost prefecture of Japan, um, you know, small island. Um, the Okinawans have consumed sweet potatoes as their staple, very similar to the Papua New Guineans of Tukasinta, um, and they consumed more than 80% of their diet as sweet potatoes for a, at least around the last 200 to 300 years. That's been the staple of their diet. So I have data. So we can get into data beginning around 1960. And we know Japan has, you know, if we go back to about 1960, they're one of the, they're, they're probably the most, uh, the healthiest population of all of the developed nations, right? Okay, so so here's let me give you some of their data, Brian. I'm, and I'm reading this off of my, you know, I've got this handy here. So this is what their total calories were was at around 1960, 2837. By around 2004 to 2010, that had dropped around 31 percent down to 1950 calories. Their carbohydrates back when they were extremely healthy 
in 1960, 84%. By 2004, they're down to 56%, all right? Their fat consumption went from 5% up to, during the same time frame, 1960 to about 2004, went to 27, 27%, all right? So their fat consumption more than quadrupled. Their saturated fat, 7% recently, that's the lowest in the develop, developed world. Um, their sugar, I don't have the data handy, but their sugar went up from 1961 until 1989 and then dropped fairly substantially since, 19, uh, since 1989, sugar has been on the decline. All right, okay. So just to recap, we've got since 1961, overall we have carbohydrates going down, uh, I'm sorry, we've got total calories going down, carbohydrates going down. Since 1989, we have sugar going down, right? Okay, but what's going up? Vegetable oils. Nine grams a day in 1961, up to 39 grams a day in 2004. So vegetable oils went up four and a half fold. Now, let me tell you what happened to them. So obesity in men doubled, went from 16% in 1978 to 31.2% in 2010. This didn't happen to the women, but it happened to the men. Breast cancer went up right at about five-fold just between 1975 and 1999. Um, three other cancers, I believe it was, went up at least two to three-fold during that same time frame. Diabetes went from 0.02% in 1954 to 6.9% in 2007. That's a 345-fold increase, right? Okay. Macular degeneration was 0.2% in the late 1970s, but between 1975 and 1979, went to 16, increased in prevalence to 16.37% by 2013. That's an 82-fold increase, all right? And here's their omega-6. So I calculated this. You know, 1961, their omega-6 consumption was 1% of their calories, but by 2009 was 7.8% of calories. So again... While calories, carbohydrates, and sugar are going down, their obesity, breast cancers, diabetes, macular degeneration, all through the roof, right? What are you going to blame it on? Yeah, it's crazy that the calories went down. This is something that fascinates me. I've talked about it with a few other people on podcasts before that we used to be able to eat more calories. Right? This is more of the pro-metabolic people, the people that are eating a lot of fruit and they, they they believe the same things. They believe meat is healthy, organs are healthy. They believe seed oils are the problem. And they believe that, well, not, uh, yeah, that they eat, can eat more calories if, and we did eat more calories in the past, when our metabolism worked correctly. And I've right. seen this too, anecdotally, is some people, they can, they have to eat very few calories or they gain weight. They, you know, they try to force themselves to be thin because you're eating the wrong food. Well, this is what I'm talking about. This is where it talk, you know, gets into the destruction of the mitochondrial machinery at the level of the electron transport chain. That's what the omega-6 does. It cripples that, that uh, the metabolism there. And this is why I say, you know, that I've been, I believe, and I, I believe I understand the science correctly, that when you cannot properly burn fat for fuel, you will preferentially store that fat as lipid droplets in your in your cells. And the cell is a microcosm of what's going on at the whole body level. I mean, so whatever is happening in one of your cells is an indication of what's happening in all, you know, 37 trillion of them, whatever it is, um, right? And so that's what's happening. You're crippling that, mito that mitochondrial machinery when you consume uh, vegeta vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. And just to let people know, it's semi-interchangeable. If we're talking about vegetable oil, seed oil, omega-6, or linoleic acid, they're all kind of meaning the same thing. It's just this high unnatural ratio of these certain types of oils. I'm glad you said that, Brian. It's, let me just throw this out. So they, for those who don't get, you know, who didn't quite get that, and we, you know, we haven't really talked about this yet, but but so the, the seed oils, all that list that I named before, um, they range um, in, in the omega-6 linoleic acid or LA from around 20% in canola oil up to 78% in safflower oil. And so the two most common oils in restaurants, in fast food and in processed food in the US is canola and soybean. And soybean oil, 
runs about 54 to 56% omega-6 linoleic acid. All right, now contrast that with you know, natural animal fats. So if so, 100% grass-fed beef is right around 2% or 2.5% omega-6 linoleic acid. And um, even CAFO-raised beef that's corn and soy-fed, their omega-6 linoleic acid will still be around 3 or 3.5%. And, three and, and uh, entirely naturally raised, traditionally raised chicken and pigs will also have around 2.5% and 2% omega-6 linoleic acid, respectively, for those two. Because the, but those will go, the omega-6 linoleic acid in chickens and pigs will become very high, just like humans, because we're all monogastric. So the monogastric animals they, uh, that are uh, unlike the ruminants, like the, the, the cattle, they cannot biohydrogenate omega-6 fat into monounsaturated and saturated fats, which is what those, what's the cattle can do. So no matter what you feed cattle, they'll have a low omega-6 fat. But chickens and pigs, they'll go clear up to 20 plus percent, just like humans in their body fat. If you and, feed them the wrong diet, exactly. I just want to make right. that clear. Yeah, so you switch to the CAFO. So the CAFO version can get up to 20% if they're just eating corn meal and soybean meal and soybean oil. Right, exactly. And so you want to, you have to, so the things you need to avoid are the, 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 the seed oils, the ones we listed already. And then you want to avoid CAFO raised chicken and pork because they're going to have high omega-6 linoleic acid. And in my view, I think we should, drastically limit nuts and seeds because they're also very high in omega-6 and you know there's almost almost no populations that ever consumed a lar large amounts of uh of nuts they just ge generally are not available i mean you've you got you know some a couple of the african populations would consume mongongo nuts um did you see that did you see that when you were there brian or no Oh, I saw them hunting meat. <laughs> yeah, no, I saw Maasai drinking blood and milk, and I saw yeah. Hadza hunting meat. But I'm sure when I wasn't there, they may have collected some nuts, or they, yeah, I mean, I don't think they're available year round. No. And uh, yeah, I, I know that so, some, yeah, in studies or scientists have observed them getting a lot of calories from Mongongo nuts. But what are those high linoleic acid? Or are they? Yeah, and the and. And uh, the only population that I'm that I really know very much about in terms of consuming mongongo nuts significantly is the the kung san, um, the, or some people call it uh, ai kung. Um, but it's anyway, like exclamation uh, mark kung. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, mm -hmm. and that population does consume mongongo nuts, but they are they should not be <laughs> looked at as a population to um, to um, try to mimic uh, because they are, th first of all, the reason that they consume those nuts is because they can't find enough animals to eat. And uh, so they're scrounging for anything they can get. And many of their kids are malnourished. Um, mm -hmm. I noticed that they've got, they, they, they have um, uh, quashior core. Um, mm -hmm. and you can see it, you know, the it's distended bellies. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, so they're, just, they're starved. And so, and so that, yeah, that's not a good population. That's, that's one of the few hunter gatherers that isn't doing, you know, relatively well. Well, cause they're not really hunting and gathering anymore. This is a bigger story. I've talked about this on other podcasts. It's a huge story. And I think what's wrong with some of these Harvard scientists that are using the very recent hunter gatherers as an analog to what we did in the past, and it's completely false. And we, I guess Mickey Bendor was, uh, I did a lot of content on this. Mickey Bendor did a lot of research and published papers on how many large, gigantic animals we used to hunt, how they were here for most of history. This is what we ate. And very recently, for many reasons, the government's pushed them off their land. We have game reserves where they make a lot of money showing tourist animals. And that's where all the big animals are. And the Hadza, yes, I was with them. They have no animals to hunt. They get tiny little antelope. They get tiny little bush babies. And they have to resort to baboons. This is all the animals that are left. And so that's not characteristic of what we did for the lion's share, 99% of human history. We had access to gigantic animals with fat and red, you know, ruminant animals. Right.
Yeah, absolutely, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, this might be another one that's really interesting. We could talk about, if you want to, the United States and sugar versus vegetable oils. Um, is that something you'd want to talk about or no? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, because I think this is, like I said, you know, we've got the best data going way back uh, in the United States. Um, so let me just paint this picture if I could. So if you go clear back to 1890, and we and so we we actually gathered the data, um, my colleague, Maria Stoyanowska, way back when we were studying macro degeneration, um, she gathered data on the and sugar consumption going back to 1840. But Stefan Guillenet and one of his colleagues got sugar consumption back to 1822 the 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 um and they come out to be virtually identical because we're using the same data sets so they're they're basically identical but i want to point this out so you know in 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 the, in the 19th century for people who haven't heard this there's just virtually no heart disease known uh, it was there was eight papers um eight or nine papers um you know on coronary heart disease in the 19th century um worldwide so, was, and, and only two or three of those mentioned um, thrombotic coronary heart disease, meaning the equivalent of myocardial infarction or heart attack. So the disease was virtually unknown. In fact, the first known, you know, heart attack, 1912 in the United States, James Herrick um, published that evidence with, you know, autopsy evidence. The obesity in the 19th century, 1.2%. 1, 1 That's Scott Allen Carson's work, men age 18 to 80. Diabetes, 1890, 0.0028%, Brian. That's 2.8 per 100,000 people in 1890. Um, and yet in 1890, we already were consuming 211 calories worth of sugar in the U.S. per, uh, per day. That's 10.8% of calories. So we were, by 1890, we were already above the current World Health Organization's recommendations for sugar consumption. Yet obesity you know, practically unknown, diabetes, extraordinarily rare, heart disease unknown, cancer was very, very unusual. Um, we could go on and on. Macular degeneration unknown, right? Okay, uh, let's jump up to, and then by 1907, we were at 310 calories worth of sugar. That's 15.8% of our calories. And yet, you know, again, obesity, probably around 1% still, right? 1935, Sugar was at 440 calories. That's 22.5% of caloric consumption in the U.S., 1935. Okay, 440 calories. Now, let's jump all the way to 2016. Sugar consumption went up 86 calories from 1935, went up to 526 calories and 24% of calories. All right, so we went from 22.5% of calories in 1935 as sugar to 24% in 2016. All right, but diabetes went from 0.0028% or 2.8 per 100,000 to 13% or 13,000 per 100,000 in this same time frame between 1890 and 2016, all right? And obesity went from 1.2% in the 19th century to 42.5% um, by 2018 in the U.S., right? Um, but what did the vegetable oils do? So the vegetable oils were at, um, in 1935, 146 calories. That's 7.5% of caloric consumption. And by 2016, that was 713 calories or 29% of caloric consumption. Okay, so just to compare the two, between 1935 and 2016, as an absolute number, sugar went up 1.5%. Went up from 22.5% to 24%. Vegetable oils went from 7.5% of the diet to 29% of the diet. It went up 21.5%. So in other words, a more than a fifth of all of our food between 1935 and 2016 became vegetable oils. More than a fifth of every plate of food in the, whole, in the entire you know, nation, right, became vegetable oils while all this happened. So sugar barely changed. Right, it went up 86 calories in that time frame, and uh, one and a half percent of our calories. But look what happened to the vegetable oils, and this is what this is kind of what we're seeing all around the world now is this same general trend: is that you've got you know you, very, generally in the last 50 years, there's not much change in 
There's no ch almost no change at all in carbohydrates. In fact, as I mentioned early on, worldwide they've gone down 1.5 percent. We went down, we went from 64 and a half percent of calories as carbohydrate worldwide in the early 1960s to 63 percent of calories as carbohydrate by around 2010, I believe it was. Uh, right. So the so and and, and as I mentioned, the, the uh, sugar went up five five percent during that time frame. But the, but the vegetable oils um, have gone up, you know, in developed nations between just between 1963 and 2003, vegetable oils in developed nations doubled. And in developing nations, they tripled during that time frame. Mm. Wow. And yeah. that's a good, I, that's crazy. Well, I want to talk, go back a little bit because developing nations, sure. so, and we talked about the token allowance that had this crisis happen so fast. And you see with the Native Americans, very, very abrupt change in their diet, very abrupt change in disease, tons of disease. What do you think it is? There's certain populations that are so affected by this more than others, right? Oh, that yeah. Well, that, that's, the, that's where the genetics comes in. And so so, you know, there, there's genetic susceptibility for everything. And I, I am absolutely convinced, Brian, that we Americans tolerate this diet better than any, and especially the vegetable oil, <laughs> better than any other population, race, ethnicity on the entire planet. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, I mean, so certain like the, the Native Americans are extremely susceptible to this, just as are the Pacific Islanders. And they were both, you know, hundreds of years ago, phenomenally healthy populations. Well, like I mentioned, the Pacific Islanders were incredibly healthy up mm -hmm. through the early 20th century, up to mm -hmm. 1945 even. They were incredibly healthy, very, very robust, very physically fit people. Same thing with the Native Americans. They, they were legendary, especially the ones that ate a lot of meat. They were tall, strong, thin, and then very yes. quickly, then the government gave them like oil and cornmeal or something and they made fry bread and right. they quickly declined. I mean, yeah, I've heard of people talk about the genetic susceptibility kind of kind of in the sense of, well, Americans and a lot of Europeans had many generations of relying on sort of low quality foods like grains. And we just we were able to, yeah, just sort of have this epigenetic uh, ability to consume these foods and not get sick better than people that didn't have these in their diet, then all of a sudden got them. Right. Right. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, so I like the old saying, you know, genetics loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. And in my view, that environment is more than, I think it's 99% di uh, diet because, you know, and I, I know that everybody talks about, well, there's all these other pillars that are so incredibly important. Uh, um, you know, and they talk about, you know, sleep and grounding and EMFs and, and, you know, plastics and there's all these other issues, just as you mentioned. And I agree with all that. Yeah. I, I agree. Those are issues. But as you also said, Brian, um, so astutely, you know, what is the big driver? You know, what if, and like you mentioned in the Pacific islands, well, you know, they're still living in a pristine environment, but they're getting vegetable oils. They've convinced the Pacific islanders are now convinced that they need to be consuming the good white man's, you know, vegetable oil that comes from the United States, which is canola oil and soybean oil. That's what they're, they, in fact, they reviewed, there, there was a, there, there were some researchers that went into multiple grocery stores and, and, and convenience stores. They could not find coconut oil. And that's what kept them so healthy. All, oh, no. They're convinced, they've convinced them that they need to be eating our soybean oil and canola oil because it's heart healthy, right? Just like that we've done worldwide, you know, with all these, these organizations, uh, oh. you know, with, I mean, you know, from the American Heart Association, from Harvard, Tufts, you know, the nutrition departments of Tufts, Mayo, Cleveland Clinic, on and on. They're, you know, they're, they're convincing the, the people, right? That these are, these oils are heart healthy because they drive LDL cholesterol down. And indeed they do, you know, and that it's, <laughs> it's insane. It's just insane. It hurts my head to think about it. The propaganda, like there's so many reasons for it. There's, yeah, there's all this money to be made. There, there's so many different 
the, the different motivations. But I saw that in Africa, I went to the grocery store and they have aisles, an entire aisle of canola oil. There's everything that was margarine and canola, but it, it's on purpose. It's like, it's not just, okay, here's your canola. Oil. You know, they have just a little, there's one bottle. They just have the same bottle across the entire row, the entire row. Right. And it's all the big jug at the bottom. And there's like 50 big jugs taking up the entire aisle. Then the next one, next biggest bottle, entire aisle. So the whole shelf is the different vegetable oils. And there's another one with the fake butters. And what are they going to think to buy? You know, it's like, right. this is it. This is, this, these are the options. This is the best. This is all on purpose. It's insane. I, I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you know, I looked at data for 2014 the, because, and also, as you mentioned early on, Brian, this is just, it was, it's a money-making scheme. It was from the very beginning and it remains that way. It's all, it's always about the money, um, you know, that, that, I mean, they first made cottonseed oil and then soybean oil to, and Crisco, all of those were made to supplant and replace butter, lard, and beef tallow. And that's exactly what they've done and still are doing today. And I looked in, in the year 2014, um, the, the manufacturer's cost, like if you're a big food company and you want to buy soybean oil, I, um, it was $1 per kilo mm. in 2014. $1 per kilo. Okay, so let me, that's 1,000 grams. So a typical Americans in, in, um, in 2010 consumed 80 grams of vegetable oil per day. All right. So how much does that cost a big food manufacturer? 5.6 cents is what they pay for 80 grams of soybean oil. That's 720 calories worth of food. I use the term loosely. And that's what they're paying for it. And so then I determined, well, what would they pay if they were buying, if they were buying sugar again? internationally, what was the average cost? It was 36 cents. So it's more than six fold higher, mm -hmm. you know, to, to buy butter instead, which would have kept the whole world healthy. Oh, wait, butter right? or sugar? You switch from sugar butter. to butter. Oh, butter. Yeah. What You said was sugar. I saying, was I saying sugar? Okay. So no, no, but for the last 80, one, so 80 grams, 80 grams worth of vegetable oil would cost the, I, let me rephrase that then if I said sugar, I'm sorry. So 80 grams worth of vegetable oil per day would cost them 5.6 cents. Mm -hmm. And that's 720 calories worth of food. And if you replace that with butter, that would cost instead of 5.6 cents, it would cost 36 cents. So mm -hmm. to replace the yeah. vegetable oil with butter. Yeah, is what I meant. If I don't know what I said, Brian, but maybe yeah, I yeah, no, that makes sense. you just said sugar at, at, at one point, but yes, butter. Okay, <laughs> no, it would probably be even more. And it there's so many reasons. It's hard to even make all these shelf table stable products with butter, right? It makes sense why they just stuff seed oils into everything because it's shelf yeah. stable, it's cheap, it's almost right. free. I mean, it's, right. it's insane. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Holy smoke! So. We know we know the problem here. I want to talk about another couple studies. Uh, let me go to the, your book. Okay, there's this really interesting one in, in rodents. So you said it's super hard to do human studies. I think mm -hmm. people understand that by now. If you've listened mm -hmm. to my show, this is part of the reason why the problems exist. It's super hard to do the studies. It's super expensive. No one's funding the studies to do to show that animal foods are healthy, that natural fats are healthy. Right? Who's going to pay for that? There's no money right. in it. So right. we have to sometimes use rodent studies and you put this in the book, isocaloric diet with, and there's three different groups. There's beef fat, olive oil, and safflower oil. So I, all the same calories, and this is in rats. Uh, the fat was all the same, 59% of the diet. What well, the difference was the omega-6 percentage, right? So it's with a beef fat group, that's 4.4%. Omega-6, olive oil, 7.7%, safflower oil, 36.6%. So I don't know if you have this in front of you, but- I don't. Body so keep fat, going, keep going. Yep, so then what did, what did that result in? And this is a 1993 study. I will put in the show notes. And it's uh, who by uh, Dietary Opan, I think is the lead author. Dietary Lipid Profile is a- determination of tissue, phospholipid, fatty acid composition, and rate of weight gain in rats. 
So in the B fat group, body fat. Oh, that's the, the yeah. Uh, I'm going to go to weight gain. Okay. So the relative weight gain with the beef tallow. Oh, wait. Okay, so with the olive oil group, the equivalent was 12.8 pounds of fat in the human equivalent gained. And in the safflower oil, 21 pounds equivalent of human fat gained. So basically... In three weeks. In three weeks, yes. Yeah. And yeah. the difference in the, in the linoleic acid in the body fat was 10.3% with the beef fat, 15.2% with the olive oil, and 54.5% with the safflower oil. Yeah. Yeah. So again, the critical understanding there is these are isochloric diets. These are equal calorie diets. The only difference is the omega-6 linoleic acid. They're all consuming and they're all consuming the same amount of fat and carbs and protein, right? The only difference is, is how much is omega-6, right? And uh, yeah, this is what you see in some, in, in the other um, animal studies too, is, you know, just if you increase the, uh, the omega-6 linoleic acid, um, even on isochloric diets, you will make these rodents morbidly obese in a few weeks to a few months, up to, you know, six months or five months or so, you, you can almost double their weight um, in those that have the higher omega-6, even on the exact same calories as those that are consuming the chow, which is like 1% omega-6 linoleic acid. Yeah. And I want to throw this out there because I always want to check myself and, uh, you know, we have this unbiased approach, look at all the angles and even like, say Dr. Ted Naiman, respect him completely. He's the man. I absolutely love him. But lately he's been saying, what if it's just the calories, right? That they're just, people are just eating excess energy. And what if there isn't so much a problem with the seed oils? It's more the fact that people are just eating so many extra empty calories from the oils. That's a problem. And maybe we need to have more of a discussion on that with him and you. And I mean, you've laid out so many reasons so far why it's more than just the calories and it's about the the breakdown products and all the inflammation and pro-inflammatory problems and the mitochondrial disruption and this and that but I, it's just interesting that he kind of thinks that it might just because be because people are just eating more calories in general from these oils and it's not that they're specifically inherently bad what what do you say well, that's where, you know, as we've already presented here, that you know, there are multiple um, really good animal studies that have already looked at this um, and, and shown that on the higher omega-6 diets that the rodents become morbidly obese very, very rapidly. They also develop congestive heart failure. They develop diabetes, fatty liver disease, all of that on the higher omega-6, you know, seed oil supplemented diets um you know and it, it's uh really none of that makes any sense with anything that i've ever seen um you, you know i think that we would have if it was just extra calories and that was the problem i mean people have always been able to overeat right and people could get um you you can get it's possible to get obese um with an all natural diet that has no processed food. I agree. You can get, become you obese, but you, yourself. Won't, yeah, but you won't become sick. Yeah. You will not develop, you won't develop heart disease. You won't develop diabetes. You won't develop fatty liver. You won't become insulin resistant. You won't, none of this will happen, right? You won't get cancer. Probably most likely all these things, you'll probably remain healthy and obese. Most likely. Right. Um, and it's exceedingly hard. It's, I mean, cause you could look at 19th century Americans, you know, why was only 1% of them obese? Oh yeah. Right? Assumably there'd be a number of people say 20% of the population just overeats and loves to eat and wants to overeat, but they're 20% weren't obese 20 and they didn't have all the problems. So I, I think it is, ex I, I say it's possible. Yes. You can become, if you really want to, you can become obese. I think it's very hard to do on the natural diet, I, on natural I think food. so too. And I think it would naturally regulate. I've talked about this with Ted over the years and the thought experiment. If you were put on a desert, a, a remote island, and all you had access to was natural foods, that you would just arrive at your goal body weight. 
because you because of the satiety effects and all the nutrients that even if you did try to overeat maybe you could temporarily get kind of fat but you naturally just sort of come to your normal weight at some point i think so unless unless there's some other underlying problem you know if you if you end up with a some you know if you end up with iron deficiency for example or maybe a copper deficiency or something else or, or some kind of inflammatory condition you know, like if you get a parasite or something, these kind of things can make you, or you get a, you know, B1 deficiency. You can get, all these things can make you insulin, insulin resistant. And those can drive weight gain. But in general, I completely agree with you, Brian. It's, you know, it's, it's the huge majority of people are just naturally going to end up at their, at their, <laughs> their perfect, you know, desirable weight. Well, that's what's happened for all of history. I mean, it is. You don't even have to do the thought experiment. We just see it by the numbers. You see it everywhere you look. Everywhere you look in history, and every population who's on a you know natural diet, they're all basically, for the most part, they're 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 lean or and. But main thing is they're healthy. I mean, even if they're not perfectly lean like the Inuit traditionally, they're healthy though, and that's what's that's what's important to you know to most of us. I mean. You know, I, I mean, I realize that, you know, people that are 20 and, you know, you know, teenagers and 20s and 30s, they're thinking more about fitness and whatnot than than somebody who's older like me. But but in general, as, as you get older, you start thinking about that, you know, you start seeing your family members become maimed and, and die and what from from these diseases. And mm -hmm. I've watched it in my own family. And and that's what that's why I do this work really is to try to bring this message to the masses. Well, it's important stuff. Uh, we got a few more minutes here. What else we got? I mean, we've, have we hit all your, your favorite talking points, the, the big studies? Well, if you want to go give me two minutes, I'll, uh, if I could, I'll mention Absolutely. China for sure. Sound good. Um, because China is really interesting and this is, you know, covered well in the book too. So, um, China ob obviously is traditionally very, you know, very high carbohydrate, um, diet as well. They're very similar to Japan. Um, but I want to mention that, um, s since, since the, about the, uh, about 1980 sugar consumption in China has been two and a half percent of calories, roughly this is 60 to 80 calories. Mm per day. This is equivalent of four teaspoons of sugar per day. And it's stable, mm -hmm. right? Since about 1980, it has not changed. Um, but the vegetable oils, if we go clear back to, um, 1961, their vegetable oils were about 30 calories a day. And there, and by 2018, their vegetable oils had increased to an average of 204 calories per day. All right. So they went up, whatever that is, mm -hmm. um, you know, six, seven fold or something like that, R roughly about seven, about seven fold. Right. And okay. Dur just in this time frame. So here's what happened with their health during this time frame as these vegetable oils go through the roof. Uh, oh, and by the way, their sugar consumption is the eighth lowest in the world. If I didn't mention that. All right. Cancer between 1990 and 2017 went up this is overall cancer incidence went up 3.2 fold. Diabetes increased just between 1990 and 2017 from 3.7% to 6.7%. That's a 78% increase just in that mm -hmm. um, 17 year period. Cardiovascular disease went up 15% between 1990 and 2017. Overweight and obesity combined um, increased from 15.3% in 1991 to 42% in 2015. Mm. All right. So it almost tripled, right? But that's enormous. And um, the cancer increase included a 465% increase in lung cancers while the smoking prevalence went way down. Mm. Why? You know, so the question is, why? Yeah. Because vegetable oils drive cancer too. And that's, that, that's even another, you know, we haven't talked about that very much, but they, they are the primary driver of cancer. I'm absolutely, absolutely, 
absolutely convinced. In fact, the researchers know this. They know that they have to put animals on higher omega-6 diets if they want to induce cancer. Mm. You know, they cannot, even when they give them the carcinogens or, ra or ra irradiate them, they need to put them on higher omega-6 diets in order to produce cancers. I, to my knowledge, there is no uh, methodology that where they can reliably produce cancer in animals without higher omega-6 diets. Wow. Yeah. And, and it includes lung cancer like this. These people are not even, they're not smokers and they're getting lung cancer, right? This is what we, you know, this is what we've seen in China since the 1980s. Well, yeah, and then they just started frying everything in oil. <laughs> what did yeah. they fry before? Because it was, yeah, it's pretty low before. I, I guess they just used natural animal fats because that's what they had at their disposal. Yeah, well, okay, they used natural animal fat and they used se uh, some sesame oil and peanut oil. But um, keep in mind that they the sesame oil and peanut oils are safer, not safe, but safer because they're not... Um, they're not, uh, they don't require heating in the processing phases. Mm -hmm. And so since they're not heated, they have lower levels of the advanced lipid oxidation end products. But keep in mind, you know, the Chinese, like the Japanese, consu traditionally consume a very low fat diet. So mm -hmm. it's very high carbohydrate. Yeah, it's just like natural foods. It's sweet potatoes, rice, vegetables, yeah. fish. Yeah. Meat, whatever, yeah, whatever they could get a hold of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Holy yeah. smokes. Yeah, the cancer thing. And so what do you think is going on with cancer specifically? You mean what induces well, that? Yeah, yeah. What, yeah. Why? How does it induce cancer? Uh, so I, you know, it, cancer um, as, d d did you have Thomas Seafried on your show? Yes. I thought so. Yeah, I, I th thought you did. Okay. So as you know, from his work, um, that you know cancer is a metabolic disease mm -hmm. and that is absolutely positively true everything okay. i do he said i mean 95 i forget the percentage yes there are some cancers that aren't but the vast majority are metabolic that's what he said oh yeah i'll bet it's 99 percent plus mm -hmm. and i yeah you know, i just don't see that there's any cancers that are truly genetically driven without the impetus of the diet playing a role and it's really in a nutshell it's, you know, the high omega-6 um, drives the metabolic disease because of exactly what I kept referring to, the fact that it's devastating to the mitochondrial mm -hmm. function. So when you, when you can't produce energy properly at the cellular level, then all of the cellular machi machinery begins, begins to fall apart. And this is where you head down the path of producing um, mutations, right? And, and this is carcinogenesis, carcinogenesis at work is when you, you the, the best way to do that is to cripple energy production because then you can't carry out you can't produce proteins properly which you know which are the enzymes that 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 create all of the you know all of the metabolic pathways are are you know uh uh they're driven by proteins right essentially i mean proteins and you know their cofactors and so everything begins to fall apart when you have energy failure. And then on top of this, you know, you have, you need all of the vitamins and minerals in place um, to help to prevent cancer. I mean, this is what Price, Weston Price showed essentially, right? Was, you know, that cancer was being driven by lack of nutrients, right? This is what, because he couldn't, he didn't have the capability of knowing about all of the toxicity the, you know, the pro-oxidative, pro-inflammatory and toxic effects of vegetable oils, right? He, there wasn't possible back in the 1930s, but he knew that the, these foods that, you know, that these processed foods drove uh, nutrient deficiency, which drove cancer, right? Because it was a degenerative disease, as he said. Mm -hmm. And um, so you put those two together. And again, this is the recipe for cancer. So yes, you know, if you and I eat the exact same diet for 50 years, I might, you know, drop dead of a heart attack and you might get cancer or vice versa because of our genetic predisposition mm -hmm. or susceptibility. But it's the same, but the diet is what's driving all of it. Exactly. And if we eat the correct human diet, we shouldn't get any of these problems, even if we have the bad genetics. And I wanted to kind of leave on that note, 
because if people know my story or if they've seen the intro to my film series, Food Lies, which you should go check out on my YouTube, the Food Lies YouTube channel, the three and a half minute intro is great and it explains my story. Talk about losing both my parents, cancer and Alzheimer's. And so theoretically, I have these genes, right? This suppo supposed susceptibility to cancer and Alzheimer's, but I'm not worried. I'm not worried because I started making these changes nine years ago and I am not worried about expressing these supposed genes. Maybe, you know, people may know about uh, Alzheimer's and ApoE4. And if you have the two alleles that you're more prone to Alzheimer's. My understanding through talking to great doctors and scientists on this podcast is that yes, maybe people who have the, the ApoE4 genes are more susceptible and they get more Alzheimer's because they are less adapted to the modern diet. That's how I understand it now. Does that make sense? Like these people and the people with the, the double ApoE4 gene are supposedly the most ancient genetics, right? This is the, so these are people who maybe need the ancestral diet the most, right? So that makes sense why they would have more Alzheimer's because no one's eating the ancestral diet. In the mainstream population, 99% of people are not eating an ancestral diet. They're eating the wrong foods, they're eating the wrong fats. So of course, more of them are having Alzheimer's because no one's eating correctly. But if I eat correctly, I'm eating only the natural fats. I don't even use olive oil. I don't even trust olive oil anymore. Half of it is bogus. Avocado oil studies show it's all bogus. You know, it's, it's stepped on with other oils. I just use natural fats. I eat natural foods and I feel amazing. I mean, you know, fit. And I don't think I'm going to get these diseases, even though supposedly I have the susceptibility for them. You know, and I would go so far, Brian, as to say that I feel absolutely 100% confident you will never get those diseases. That I think it's impossible for you to get those diseases because I, because you're eating like me. You know, we're both we both understand these principles, and I think you know. I tell people I think that I believe that if you've consumed a um, an ancestral diet for three years probably maybe five, but for probably for three years, then your, your uh, likelihood, and if you don't have any of these things already, your likelihood of developing any significant coronary heart disease or cancer or stroke, um, heart attack, diabetes, all these things goes down to about zero. Yeah. That's all it takes. Three years, because if you go three years, you will drop your body fat omega-6 down to ancestral levels. And that's a and that's a big deal. So as long as you eat, you know, native traditional foods and it's a nutrient-dense diet like you and I do, and we're really careful about that. We make sure we're getting all of our nutrients satisfied and we test for that if we need to. But if you do all those things, I think we're immune to those things, just like all the populations, all these ancestrally living populations all around the world, you know from Africa to the Pacific Islands to South America, you know, we see that they don't get these diseases when they don't consume these processed foods. It's just that simple. Yeah, they die of other things. Yeah. Right. And if the naysayers out there, they're like, no, they die of other things. They d d die of accidents and infections and things that have nothing to do with diet, right? So this is, and they do live long. And there's studies that show that these, even the mo more modern hunter gatherer populations live in late seventies. A lot of them, even with all Absolutely. of it, without modern medicine, they still live long and, and they're still strong too. They're, they're not decrepit, you know, in a hospital bed. till they're 78, they're hunting and moving around and living like a human. So. Yeah. Oh, and those are, and those are the environments that these people living hunter, being a hunter gatherer is, that is a brutal life. <laughs> Living yep. out in the elements, you know, right? I mean, you know, you don't have, you don't have a home. You don't. Have, I mean, you know, like like what we think yeah. of as a home. You don't have air conditioning and heating or whatever. You know, living out in those elements that is that is a rough that's a rough life. And yet the uh, yeah the modal age of death is seventy two. Gervin and Kaplan showed that way back in like nineteen ninety that that's how the typical age for those that survive childhood. Their modal death, age of death is 72 years. Exactly. That's the most often um, yeah. age of death is 72. And yeah, that, right. a lot of the stats out there are completely skewed because they say the average, which is not what we need to look at, would be in their 30s. That's just because so many people died in childbirth or other causes in, in youth. So completely throws off the average. But yeah, uh, people should know that by now.
And last thing before we go, super important about the ancestral levels of the linoleic acid of these omega sixes in our diet is something around two to three percent. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So we should we should be consuming um, less than two percent omega six linoleic acid in our diet. And you will do that, you know, almost everybody will be able to do that if you consume, you know, an ancestral diet without any vegetable oils and with animals that are raised properly on their ancestral diet. Meaning, again, not corn and soy fed, mm -hmm. corn and soy fed animals. So you'll get to that level. And if you avoid um, and if you avoid nuts and seeds yeah, you'll get to that level. Yeah, because that's not natural too. You can't just year round be stuffing nuts and seeds in your face. That's that's not possible throughout history. So no. I think I don't know if you said this before, but in the world population, are there any populations in the world that have little yeah the the levels around two to three percent that are sick? Not that I'm aware of. No, absolutely not. That's what you, I thought, right? If any no, population, no. no matter high carb, low carb, this, that, no. if you have the natural human ratio, right? Or low levels of linoleic acid, which come from all the seed oils, you should be healthy. And that's what we've seen across the entire history. I, I've looked at a, uh, quite a number of these um, and everywhere, you know, from, you know, like I said, from the Maasai, for the, the Papua New Guineans of Tukacinta, um, to um you know to to bolivians um you know you look at all these different uh to the japanese you can go on and on um they're all consuming under two percent omega-6 linoleic acid um, on their native traditional diet yes well everyone knows what to do <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. eat whole foods eat animal foods avoid the cedos avoid the brazos foods amazing dr chris Thanks for coming on and everyone yeah, buy the book. He's not making money on this book. The ancestral health foundation, you know, could make a few bucks off this and just do more good work and, you know, do more projects in the future. So where do people get it? Is it, it's just coming out, right? Yeah, it's out and they can, you can get it almost anywhere books are sold now. Um, but probably most people will go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble books, a million, those kind of places. Um, so yeah, it's available to all those. Very cool. And do you have a personal website or anything? Uh, currently, the only one we have is Cure AMD Foundation's website. So we're working on the Ancestral Health Foundation website. Um, but you can go to cureamd.org um, if you want to come to our, um, our existing website at this point. And then the other one will be ancestralhealthfoundation.org, and that'll be available soon. Very cool. Well, Looking okay. forward. We're trying to get you down to Austin at some point and do a little presentation at the Sabian Center. And yeah, that'd be great. And uh, yeah, I'd love to. All right. Well, thanks for coming on and take care. Okay. Thanks, Brian. See you later.